Hello everybody, this is Nick Newman with RPG Mastery and uh, today's episode is going to be about um, some techniques I learned from um, XDM, which actually I learned those techniques from XDM from um, the Professor Dungeon Master at um, Dungeon Craft, the channel Dungeon Craft. Um, and um, basically I felt the need to share this information because I had um, I have every year I have a Halloween get together with my friends and whatnot and um, <clears throat> in these since it's Halloween we play dread which I don't know if you've ever played dread before but dread is a heck of a game um, and for all those who haven't played it, I really advise you look it up. But if you like horror games, Dread is the way to go. <clears throat> and Dread is just a a game with a, a tower, a um, Jenga tower, or, you know, the blocks that get stacked, and you pull the pieces out of the blocks and then set the piece on top of the tower. You try to get it... You try to not topple the tower over. <clears throat> and so... I'll see, I'm just skimming through this for the people who have not um, played Dread before, but um, that's the or that or Jenga even. But the idea is that this wooden block tower, if it falls, whoever touched it last in the game, their character dies. And um, <clears throat> at first, I I was like, hmm, that doesn't sound too good. And then I realized, no, if you're wanting to run a horror game and I'm just talking one shots this is not this is not a system you should use for a whole campaign for sure um, <clears throat> because there is some negative sides to the system but the positive side of the system is it is dreadful that's why <laughs> it's called dread and and it is very dreadful because everybody who gets invested in their character in any way they don't want to pull from that tower and it's very realistic in that way in that like in D&D a lot of people will be willing to go out and push the envelope and challenge themselves or whatnot. But with Dread, you'll actually have a table full of people who do not want to pull. So it's very, <laughs> it's very realistic. Like if they, for example, um, one of the games I had them in a, it was a Star Wars Dread session, which is, I loved it. So we were playing a Star Wars campaign. And so... I decided, uh, because it was Halloween, I was like, we're going to do Star Wars Dread. And they were like, what? And so I had them as uh, stormtroopers that were on a ship or a Star Destroyer or something like that. Some kind of freight uh, carrying uh, ship. And they were out in space. <clears throat> and that ship had um, the... Uh, a. am trying to remember what the virus was called. It was a virus anyway. It was like... Um, black something virus like black falcon or black i can't if you're a star wars fan you might you might know and put it in the comment for me um but um nonetheless they were trapped on this ship um and trying to get to escape pods that was the goal right but along the way we had uh other stormtroopers that were infected by this virus and were zombified and running throughout the ship trying to kill everyone and what was cool about this virus which was actual star wars lore before disney got rid of all the books or whatnot um it was actual star wars lore and um what was cool about it is the zombies kind of kept a little bit of their intelligence so as the virus spread and infected more clone troopers like they could still do routine tasks um kind of like i think there's i think it's, it's not zombie land uh, Land of the Dead. There's a movie called Land of the Dead where zombies use guns and pump gas and all this stuff. <laughs> well, it's the same kind of idea. This plague um, <clears throat> had all these clone troopers infected. And they were trying to get through the ship. I had layers of the ship that they had to get through. The elevator was destroyed. And they had to get through this layer by layer until they got to the escape pods. And then um, along the way, they would encounter things that they would have to... Actually, they would argue with each other and who would go down the hall first, who would open that door first, who would... Um, there were doors that were jammed and zombies were chasing them or trying to kill them. And uh, they had to make pulls to get the door open fast enough to save everybody, you know. 
And you know, that's what's so cool about the dread system is you actually can determine based on difficulty how many pulls a player has to make, which is pretty sweet. So like if, for example, one of them wanted to face one of these monsters, and I had it. I had these. I had the virus look or act, look and act kind of like they do in Dead Space. Those Dead Space zombies, where it deforms their body and they grow tentacles and sharp bone things that rip people apart. <laughs> and uh, but one of them had a gun, so they were on shoot it. And that's that's the thing is like it didn't matter. Um, the th creature's HP was the pull. You know what I mean? So I was like, how many? pulls do you want to, to try to put into killing this thing and they tell me you know what I mean and if I put the creature at like four pulls worth of health and they do the four pulls then they'll kill the creature and then if not the creature gets a, a turn to swipe at them which could be another two pulls so they have to really weigh out uh, how much they want to commit and how much of their own life they want to risk just like you would in real, a real fight <clears throat> so um, but I digress. <laughs> the uh, basically, my friend, we did a Halloween session the other day, and this one I would try to do a Lovecraft theme. And um, going back to what I said about um, uh, what was it, Prof the Professor Dungeon Master, um, he had recommended uh, XDM, which is a book that basically teaches you to unforget, or not un unforget, forget all the rules that you've learned to D&D thus far, um, and then go back to the bare basics of not just storytelling, but the idea of keeping your party in a coherent, guided, chaotic line, like a, a line of potential <clears throat> but you got to control your if you're a game master you're controlling the extent of the chaos but you're allowing ranges of random stuff to happen between that and that makes stories both entertaining for you as a storyteller um, and for your players <clears throat> and um, let's see uh, so here's an example my friend who played was telling his friends at work about this campaign or not this campaign this one shot story and uh, he came back and he told me he was like, uh, and I thought, I'm trying to be a little humble here. Maybe it wasn't as good because we were super sauced. <laughs> we had a lot of uh, whiskey that night and lots of beer. And uh, so we got a little toasted while we were playing. And so I was like, yeah, you know, maybe it wasn't as good as you say it was or, or whatever. Um but um, I'm trying to be humble. But at the same time, I'm very happy to hear that when he told his coworkers who played D and D and haven't played with me, uh, and a few of them are GMs too, which is and friends of mine. <clears throat> he said that the idea, the story that I pitched, or not that I pitched, but the game that he was involved in, they said that that game was ridiculous. Like it was. They've never heard of a game that flowed like that or had that much going on for one session. And I wanted to share that, not only the, to hype up the Dread system itself for all of you guys who are horror fans, because uh, unfortunately to say, um, and this is an opinion of mine, maybe I just haven't figured out the trick to it, but it's really hard to keep a horror campaign a campaign. like. Because that's part of horror is is death, lots of death, and so it's like you lose an element of that horror every time you a character dies, and you gotta replace them. And what was cool about Dread is I actually made a way to where um, when a character died in that session, they became a ghost, and that ghost could influence future pulls or help future pulls. And so what I did was I'd give them tokens, right? I gave them tokens. And then they would only, they could use the tokens to spare somebody a pull, okay? But the only way they got tokens back was from me, or from me, was by haunting players and adding to their pulls. So it was an economic balance, you know? And so it was really cool because it turned situations that were just mundane like okay the monster is trying to shred the roof open and eat you to not only is that happening but you are hallucinating that your friend is next to you um angry because you are trying to get away and you're not trying to avenge his death 
And so is that a hallucination? Is it real? It does, you don't know. And I loved, I loved it. And they loved it too, because that's the thing about traditional dread I don't like very much is that when a player dies, that's kind of the end of their inf impact on the story. And, but it's a party game. So you want people to still pay attention. And sometimes just listening to a, to somebody else make decisions constantly is not very fun. So it, to add an element of entertainment, which I had them all paying attention all the way to the end, um, to add the level t of entertainment to that, um, I gave them a little bit of control over the plot by allowing them only one, it was only one block uh, ability to change the difficulty, you know? And I let them spend as much as they want to help someone, which is cool. Um, because if they, they noticed every time um, they would enact vengeance, or they had a player who would go and <laughs> try and kill someone who had already, or one of the NPCs that killed one of the other players or the monsters, they'd be like, I'm giving my chips to you, I'm giving my chips to you. So it's like, it was like not only that, you know, the manifestation of your friend is holding the gun with you while you're executing these people, um, and his soul can rest, you know, <laughs> like, I loved it, I loved it, and they loved it too, I think, I'm pretty sure, everyone said it was a grand, a really great time, so, um, but, <clears throat> so, it was very dynamic, and I used, I don't know what this is called, but it's basically like a funnel system, and, um, like I said, check out the channel Dungeon Craft. If you haven't seen Dungeon Craft, it's amazing. <laughs> and, and there are secrets there that before I, I knew them, I didn't realize there was a level above where I was at because I was like, okay, I was very comfortable with my ability to, to, to pretty much whip a game out anytime and feel comfortable and try to keep people engaged and entertained but this took it to the, the next level <laughs> because um so here's an example right i wonder if you can see this but um <clears throat> so this is what the chart looked like for my dread uh one shot session and before you even get here you do i did some basic stuff like okay here's here i decided on a setting right and this one was going to be set. I'll just go through this real quick with you, so you so you can implement these ideas um, to your games, any of them, not just a dread game, like a whole campaign. You could use this for session by session maps, puzzles, uh, uh, pro any problems that need to be solved, or any adventure. It's wonderful. Um, but so you decide where you want to go first just to set up a game. So I decided I want to do 1920s New England, Maine. Uh, the kind of point of the game where we had was we had college students on their way to New York to celebrate New Year's. Um, and I made sure that all the players had to be 17 or 18 years old and virgins because later in the game I, um, that tends to become something of a point. Um, but the plot was Basically, happy townsfolk are sacrificing children to summon Cthulhu. <laughs> that that was the plot. And uh, let's see. So I had some cool points I wanted to put in. And this is just like basic brainstorming, which is the f best part of DMing, if you ask me. But uh, so I know I wanted a local wild kid that steals from far or steals from the farmers in the general store, and he lives in the woods, and he's feral, and people will, the players will interact with that kid, and uh, it'll be a mystery. And I, I try to keep stuff a mystery as much as you can because horror and mystery are like mm, delicious peanut butter and jelly. Um, so young local is missing her tongue from a fishing accident. Fishing accident. So I want to make sure that there was a girl there that didn't couldn't write and didn't know sign language and was missing her tongue. So she couldn't really speak. So all she could do is gesture. And I wanted that I wanted the other NPCs in the town to be like, oh, she lost her tongue in a fishing accident. And um, basically um, that would add another level of mystery because they'd be like, why the hell? How? And I was just going to make it up. I don't even remember what I had planned. But yeah, fishing <laughs> fishing accident. Um, I wanted the, yeah, there's a Catholic church priest that was digging fresh graves. Now that's always interesting because the players were automatically doing what I thought they were going to do, which was like, 
oh shit, he's burying a grave. We got to inspect that body. <laughs> like, what is it? <laughs> and I, I had a, this, you have to put some, uh, I think they're called red herrings. You got to put some things that end nowhere just to make it funny and to make, or to keep mystery flowing. Because if everything that is weird is actually weird, then nothing that nothing's weird because everything is weird. Does that make sense? Okay. So he was just burying his pet cat that had died in a small box. But the players, when they saw it, they were whispering to each other, like, that's a baby. He, that dude's burying a baby out there in a grave. That's a fucking sacrificed kid. Awesome. 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 Um, so, and then I wanted the owner of the inn, the sweetest lady in town, to be the cult leader. <laughs> that's all I started with. And you can do that too. So instead of trying to wrap yourself, your head around a whole plot or a whole, a whole story at once, try to pick out some things that are novel. Maybe things you've seen in other movies or, or when I say other movies, other, in stories that you've read or watched or anything like something else outside of, of your your game. And you can spice it up and change it and make it novel. That's what you want. You want some kind of novelty. And on top of that, you want to tie that novelty together into one coherent little tale. And so uh, you start with this method here. You start with the chart, like so. And you and what happens is these are like, it's like paths, basically. And the paths of the plot itself. So basically nothing, these are places your characters have to get to to advance forward. And, um, or situations you have to present uh, when it's needed or when the game is dulling, okay? So it's not strict. Even though it looks like it's a very strict path, it's not because I, as the game master, dictate when these events are triggered or what happens and you can change minor details. Like maybe the monster didn't attack them in the inn at night. Maybe it was attacking them in the car because they decided to sleep in the car that night. Like very simple things is if you want a fluid game, you cannot set and restrict yourself to these, these very specific details. Because even though restricting yourself to specific details like this would happen, this would happen, this would happen, that would be realistic, but realistic is not what we're going for here. What we're going for here is dynamic entertainment. We're going for constant bombardment of chaos in a controlled manner, okay? And so that's basically what this is. And so they start with the car breaking down in the forest because they had a Model T and they were rich kids and only one of the guys had a Model T and it was new. No one really knew much about cars. At least these, the 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 four people that were in this campaign or this session did. Then it went to once it broke down. You could look into the woods, and if you looked into the woods, whoever looked into the woods would find a child, the wild feral child that I was talking about, and they could search the woods by foot, and then they would find a human bone, which they never found that. Um, and that's what's neat about this is like you can skip some of this stuff and then if someone goes back into the woods later in the game You can look back on this and be like, oh, yeah, you find a bone. It looks like it's gnawed on um, And if they have a skill an intelligence skill or a medical skill You can be like that's a human bone and they can be like, oh That's a human They're okay. Just, there is something fishy going on around here and then after that after they're playing with the kid and in the woods and whatnot, the nice old man with a, with a carriage comes by and picks him up, okay? Nice old man. Okay, and that's the thing, is I wanted to be really sweet to him. And then I had a little phrase here that I made sure, that this is a plot important plot point, is that he's like, oh, you're in luck. My son will be back in town three days. Uh, he worked for the Ford factory himself. And it's like, okay, so I have given... A, a goal. So their goal is now survive for three days until the son of the inn, inn uh, keeper arrives and hopefully fixes our car so we can get out of here. Um, let's see. Um, then they meet Miss Cornwall, which is the person who tends the inn, but she's also the cult leader. And so if they were to go downstairs and investigate, they would have found robes and green lanterns and stuff. Um, but they didn't. 
And so that happened, and they had to stay for the night. And she had to warn them, and and he warned them too. He's like, "Don't go at go don't go out at night. If you go out at night, you'll be taken by the beast, and no one in town wants to talk about the beast." And this is something cool that I had taken from Dungeon Craft, in that he broke down a session of Frankenstein. I think it was, yeah, I think it was Frankenstein. And the idea that this, the Frankenstein monster was not violent. He was just a monster. And so, but because he's a monster, you trick your players into thinking that he is, or it is, the antagonist. But really, this monster was just a failed sacrifice, an amalgam of children that were melded together, who were trying, who had one consciousness and was trying to save these poor people from being sacrificed in the cove. And so, go back and then you go down and then all of a sudden I break another set of branches off. And these are areas within the town and people they can speak to. Okay, and I only had five. But just a little bit of options here, uh, this isn't solid, like they could skip any of these. But anybody who decided they wanted to investigate further, since it is a mystery, they could go to these places even individually or as a party and discuss what was going on. And if they, I, I had made it a point that if they pried too deep and made somebody too concerned with where they were going, they would get murdered, <laughs> or they would be attempt they would attempt to murder them, which would cause pulls from the tower, like the child in the woods. They tried to apprehend that child, and um, the child did try to bite one of their necks out because he's wild and feral. And the idea was this kid was kept in the cove as um, just a child who was birthed in there and never got to have human contact or anything like that, was kept in a cell, and this boy escaped, and that's why he's in the woods. And so them trying to be sweet to this kid wasn't going to really help. Luckily, one of the players was strong and had a pretty good pull, so they just ra they wrangled him up. And the other one, I gave him inventory to. I had index cards with random inventory pieces, and I would give out these cards before the game started, so they could edit some stats, write some backstory. And when I say stats, like I had to give them a bonus in one and a detriment in another. So anything that required strength, uh, dex, con, just the basic D&D stuff. I had them decide to put what they were good at. They could choose one and we would randomly roll a weakness, which I thought was pretty sweet. And so if they had a situation, for example, if they had strength they had a plus one pull the strength, that's not good means that anytime they're physically weak individuals, so anytime a physical altercation came up and their life depended on it, which is pretty often, <laughs> they would get a negative pull. So if I told them to pull one, they'd have to pull two, which they didn't want. But then they could decide where they're gonna put their bonus. Um, and then whatever that bonus is, there could be situations where I'd have them pull one, but because maybe they're investigating something and they had one in wisdom, no, they would no longer have to uh, pull at all because they had a minus one. So that's kind of what I did. And I gave them inventory. So like they gave this one was a bag of candy, which I thought was hilarious because I gave someone a gun and then I gave, <laughs> I gave someone a gun with like six rounds in it. And that was the hot item. And, uh, but I also put, made sure I put some duds in there, like, uh, a bag of candy, but it, it came in handy. It's like these mundane things do come in handy. And when you give players items, they'll play with them. Uh, because that's what humans do in real life. We get tools and things and we abstract and use them to solve our problems. And sometimes people attach so deeply that they'll use them to solve their problems, even when they could probably solve the problem without it. But it does add a, la a layer of flavor to the game. And so uh, my wife was playing, that person had a bag of candy and was using the candy to calm the feral kid down, which was cool. So, uh, and, it, and it worked to some degree. But, so all this happened and then I knew when I was ready for the game to progress, you can put time limits on these too. Like if you know you only have three hours in the game, you're like, I have to be at this plot point by hour one. And then I have to be at this plot point by hour two and then this one by hour three. And that's how you can uh, kind of manage time because in this I had sunrise and sunset. And so I had to push the game faster than I would for a normal campaign. Um, so I was like, okay, once they got through, you know, at least 50% of this, 
and if they lost interest, the sun would go down, and now they have to stay in the inn again. Um, because I'm not, like I said, this is not reality. We're not trying to imitate reality. That is a huge, I cannot understate that enough. That is a huge lesson for game masters who wish to be really good game masters, is that you trying to, you, you think, like I used to think that, the closer to reality the game was, the more realistic it was, the more people are going to like it because you're trying to live and you're trying to live a life outside your own. So the world needs to be believable and all this stuff. And it's like, to a degree, yes, you have to, it has to be believable enough for you to be able to come up with stuff randomly and ad lib or um, whatever you need to do to come up with these answers that people have to things that don't matter like what color are the trees they're black it's like do i have to have that written down no it's like when it comes up i should have faith in myself that i can answer it as we go but we're not trying to shoot for realism here we're shooting for entertainment because nothing would be entertaining real life is not that entertaining i don't know <laughs> that's a perfect example so you don't you want it to have all the best of real life, the mechanics and the physics of reality, but you want a story behind it. And that means making sure that your characters that are playing the game, your players are part of some kind of dynamic plot that they can influence. And that, uh, wrapping your head around that will take you, it'll make it to where people don't ever want to not play, don't ever want to not play in your game. They always want to be there. Um, they always want to play with you, and they get upset when you don't DM. That's the trick. Like, it's not very complicated at all, but it's, but it takes practice and confidence. And this really will help your confidence. So I don't have a whole town here, but it made it, as I described stuff to them, because your brain will just fill in these, these blanks as the game goes on. And I described this little cove and this town and all, and my friend Jimmy was like, this is crazy. Did you just, when did you come up with this? And I was like, oh, last night. And he's, <laughs> he's like, what? Because to some people that would take them an eternity to do. But that's the thing is I was creating it as we were going. Procedural generation. And then, um, so that ended up with them finding, after they would do that, they'd have to go back to sleep. I didn't care where they slept. All that mattered was they, that they slept. The beast would come back again. And this time they were gonna, the townsfolk were gonna frame the beast for killing the lady without the tongue because I was hoping they'd talk to the lady without the tongue um, because I wanted her to like communicate with him and give him too much information. And then all of a sudden she had to go, but they tried to make it look like, like the monster killed her, but it was really the townsfolk. And um, unfortunately, even though that's where the plot was going to go, it didn't go down that way because my players were so freaked out by night two that I wanted them to get to night three. Um, but I couldn't because I had put in a symbol here that they found on a tree with a moon. And they were like, uh oh, when the moon, when on the third day when the moon is full, there's something going to go down and it's not going to be good. It's probably going to be us getting sacrificed. <laughs> and, and so. On night two, they decided to break out and raise hell. And then they actually find, because they broke out, all I had to do was kind of rewind and have the townspeople do what they were going to do, but have them witness it. So uh, Jimmy's character goes outside. My wife's character stays in the room. She's like, I'm not leaving. And her, her idea was, I don't have to, if I don't make pulls, I don't die. So if I don't do anything, I don't have to make pulls. And which is really funny because that lo that's a locked, like a wrong sense of security because these townsfolk, if they killed Jimmy, which they, one of them did, he, but he took out a few people, they were going to go right to that room and then wrangle them and drag them to the cove and chain them up. <laughs> and so she thought she was getting away with it, but it was like, no, you're going to have to pull eventually. And then by the time it got to her, the tower was pretty thin <laughs> and um but um that's how you do it you try to be organic you try to roll with things because even though this is something this is what's going on because it's made in such a way like this a, a branching system 
you can make things super dynamic, super intricate, uh, and then still allow your players the ability to have choice and a lot of choice. Like you want, over, you almost want to overwhelm them with choice. Almost. You want the only thing is you want to make sure that they've got some kind of idea of what to do. Um, because you don't definitely don't want it to be like it's so free it doesn't even matter what you do no it's still something going on here and it's going to happen whether you act or not um, and I'm, a good part of horror is making sure that they're locked in a location so they were locked in this this uh, the Thornbrook Cove and Mr. Cornwall the next day that was another point I had there is that Cornwall had to wake up earlier than them and then take the the wagon out of town and that's all he did was he took it out of town so they couldn't escape um and if they were to walk the nearest towns were too far away uh in the kind of um, beginning of winter here for them to walk safely to and not get injured and they were afraid that the monster would get them at night even though the monster was just trying to warn them the whole time so if we had scenarios where they all decided, no, we'll take our chances in the woods or whatever, then you just you just digress from there where it's like, okay, now the townsfolk are chasing them and all this stuff. And it's still dynamic. It's still entertaining. But you cannot, you cannot stick religiously to this. This is just a guide. This is to make it to where you're like, where am I going with this? Because there's so much, so many pieces that I kind of want to stay on track here. And so that's part of the fun of being a game master is you're trying to uh, work with clever ways to keep everyone together and to keep the game entertaining and to have novel things happen. Um, and to treat people like their decisions that they make are actually, um, I don't know, like they're very influential. You just gotta make sure they are influential, which they are if you're a good game master, because there's no point to playing a game if you can't influence the world. So there's no point in making a world that cannot be influenced because you have determined every little bit of everything within that world. Like, you're wasting your time, you're wasting their time, and a good story beats out an immersive world uh, every time, if you ask me, because you this was just a dull town. And, but the people in it had ideas and things they wanted to do they had goals and those involved killing and, or not or not killing the players but sacrificing the virgin flesh to Cthulhu and then using Cthulhu's power to hopefully resurrect Miss Cornwall's son that was it and um, they systematically sacrificed every child in their town to do so uh, and to grant themselves immortality within this cult um, there you go. So, this is Nick Newman with RPG Mastery. Thank you for watching. Uh, please comment, like, and subscribe. I set up a Patreon account in case anyone wants to donate to me so I can make money doing this, so I can do more of it, and I can make better video quality. Like, you understand. You watch YouTube, you get it. But thank you very much. Um, uh, that's all I got.